like to welcome everybody to Cornerstone tonight. So glad to see you. Let's all stand together and we'll sing song number 479. 479. Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the Christian soldiers on the victory, hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise, brothers lift your voices, loud your anthems raise, onward Christian soldiers marching to war with the cross of Jesus going on before <laughs> like a mighty army moves the church of God brothers we are treading where the saints have trod we are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus, go soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Thank you for good singing. You may be seated. Brother Billy, would you lead us in prayer? Brother Billy, welcome everyone to our midweek service, uh, prayer time here at Cornerstone. Uh, before I get started with the missionary letter, do we have any additions, prayers, or praises to the prayer sheet for this week? Anyone at all? 
Okay, I do have a few announcements to make as well. I want to remind everyone uh, or the ladies that there's an outing to Jungle Gyms in Cincinnati this Saturday. Uh, they're meeting at the church at 9.30, and um, we're going to do lunch when they get there, and then they'll be back probably around 6-ish. Uh, if you need more information on that, please see Megan or Amanda, and they will get you all the information you need on that. Um, there's a youth activity this Saturday. They're probably already talking about that down there. We have uh, Saturday saturation on March 26th. And um, be in prayer for those traveling on spring break coming up in a few weeks, as well as we have the missions conference coming up in April. So we want to keep that in our prayers as well, praying for our missionaries as we uh, go into this missions conference season. We want to keep them and their needs in the forefront of our prayers that we can uh, ask the Lord to do great works in their fields as well. And speaking of missionaries, our letter tonight is from Russ and Sylvia Daniels to Uganda. Uh, this is hot off the presses. It came in yesterday. Uh, it says, Pastor Nabath Atusasire said, Kenyo Jojo District is a spiritually fertile, and the people there are hungry and thirsty for the true word of God. They are tired of false doctrine and false teachers. Do you remember Bisaka Uwubusodizi, the cult leader from this area who proclaimed himself to be the creator God? He died last year, leaving his followers disillusioned and searching for truth. Kin Yen Jojo is a five-hour drive from Mumbara, where Pastor Nabath is, and a six-hour drive from our work in Enteb area. Pastor Nabath has been traveling to Kin Jojo to help Brother Ivan Asimwe of the Tsuyami Bible Baptist Church with evangelism and discipleship of new believers. Now, two new churches have been started out of this church, and five men are being trained for the ministry. Pastor Naboth is asking God to call a new missionary family to this spiritually needy area in western Uganda. Has God laid a burden on your heart to come and join our missionary team in Uganda? Will you answer that call? Please pray for God to send more laborers into his harvest. Please also pray for Sylvia and I as we prepare to return to Uganda at the end of May. Sylvia's health is now much improved and her doctors have put her on a wellness maintenance program that she will follow for the rest of her life. We are thankful for your prayers and for God sparing her life. Yours for Uganda, Russ and Sylvia Daniels. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for our abilities to uh, support our families and work our jobs, that we can uh, be here in the States, that you've allowed us and blessed us with this great country, that we can work and provide for our families. Uh, we think of our missionaries that we can support and pray that their needs will be met through our abilities to give offerings and to them that we can further your work in uh, Uganda as well as other nations around the world. We think of Russ and Sylvia Daniels as they're preparing to go back to the field. We ask you to continue to heal uh, Sylvia and give her strength as they prepare to depart back there. We're encouraged by the report of uh, the two churches that are started over in Western Uganda and we're thankful that we could have, we could partake and be part of that work there. We ask your blessing on that church and the leaders therein, that they could see souls saved and they can reach out to the Ugandan people. Um, please be with the rest of the service tonight. Be with Pastor Morton as he brings us your message which you've laid on his heart. Help us to be attentive and open up our hearts and touch us with the Holy Spirit tonight and lead us and guide us as you would. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together and we'll sing song number 493, 493, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea Two. Though 
Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood. on the fourth and Lord haste the day when the faith shall be sighed the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so singing. You may be seated. Let's look to the Lord in prayer for the offering. Uh, dear Lord, we ask your blessings tonight on uh, the offerings that's taken up and that we can use it here locally to further your work at Cornerstone, as well as our supporting missionaries uh, as they preach and teach the word of God around the world. We ask your blessing on the Kids for Christ program, as well as the Spanish ministry, as they're also needing uh, that you would open up uh, their hearts to uh, the lessons that are prepared for them as well. Um, dear Pastor Morton and the preaching service in here, that we would be attentive and hear your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> All right, stand one more time and we'll sing song 508. 508, I will sing the wondrous story. All right, first, second, and the fourth. Here we go. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea on the second. I was lost when Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. 
through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea on the fourth. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Good singing. You may be seated. Amen. Good job singing this evening. Good to see you here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And if you have your Bibles, you would turn to James chapter 4. And uh, we'll pick it up where we left off last week. And just a way of review. We, we're talking about three things that we see in the first 10 or so verses of James chapter 4. Number one, we saw the endless battle of of lust, the endless battle of lust. And we talked about last week that as long as you and I are alive today, we're going to have to face this battle and the enemy of our own flesh and our own lust. And then the second thing that we looked at last week was the emptiness, the emptiness of lust. And the devil is a mastermind at promising you something through your flesh and my flesh and through our lust that our flesh and lust cannot deliver. There's nothing. It promises you everything, but in the end, you have nothing to show for it. It's all emptiness and vanity. The Bible says it where you, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. But also says, um, ye, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. The emptiness of lust. And then the third one we hit on a little bit. Uh, the envy of lust, the envy of lust, and we'll pick it up uh, right there um, this week. And we talked about last week, too. Let me just review a little bit on this subject. We talked a little bit about uh, the devil's greatest tactic, I believe, in getting us to be uh, an, an, an enemy of God by being a friend of the world. Because the Bible says we can't have it both ways. We can't be a friend of the world and still be a friend of God we always choose one or the other, and the devil is a mastermind, too, at using different tactics to subtly get us away from having a close, uh, intimate relationship with the Lord, a fellowship with the Lord, to drawing us away through our lust and our flesh, and then being a friend of the world. And he does that through entertainment. We talked last week that the devil uses entertainment as his hook to get us hooked in watching that show or watching that movie or following that YouTube channel or whatever. Gets us hooked with entertainment, and then he gets us further and further away. Now, I, I know some of you thought I might have been meddling last week, talking about uh, movies and, and how the world indoctrinates us through movies. It's the truth. It's the truth, people. If you did your research and looked into it, you find out what I told you last week was true. Uh, Entertainment's not wrong, TV's not wrong, guns aren't wrong, it's what we make out of it, but the devil's a mastermind at using entertainment to get us away from uh, spending time with the Lord and focusing our, on our relationship with Him. And we talked about how different movies have snuck in their hidden agenda in, in the movies that we, we talked about last week. In the movies, it, it, feminism in one, uh, a woman saving the world, that's mild in comparison to some of the things that we talked about uh, the world sneaking in there, uh, homosexuality, um, idolatry, witchcraft, and everything else that you can think of. Now, we're going to pick it up with, um, look at it with me in verse number four. James chapter four tonight, and look at it in verse number four. The Bible says this, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
Just once again, the Bible talks about, uh, in, in Scripture it says, you cannot serve two masters. Either you'll love the one and hate the other, you cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to choose one or the other. And Christians today would be better off just choosing to follow God and not giving in to the world. But adultery, we would all agree that adultery is a, 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 a sin in the eyes of God, right? The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, we all understand that adultery is a sin. I mean, there's nobody in here that would argue that. But here's my question for you. Did someone wake up one morning and say to themselves, I think I'll destroy my marriage today? Or was it subtle subtleties, subtle attacks, and subtle uh, temptations that eventually got them away from being faithful to their spouse and led them down the road to adultery. That's how the devil works. That's how he's worked all the way since the Garden of Eden. Yea, hath God said. He didn't come right out in just this big, bold plan. It was subtle in uh, planting those uh, thoughts of doubt. Did God really say that? I mean, is that really in the Bible? I mean, is that really something that's important? Did God really say that? And his, his tactics today, people, are, are the same. Subtle attacks to get us away from being a friend of God to being a friend of the world. Now, look, look at number, verse number 5. Verse number 5 says this, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to... What's the next word? Envy, lusteth to envy. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, the, the last, uh, last thought here that we're going to look at is not only the uh, endless battle of lust, the emptiness of lust, but we're also going to look at the envy of lust. The lusteth to envy. Now, notice where it says in that verse, verse number 5, Do you think the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Now, that, 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 that lowercase s spirit stuck out to me. Now, we already know from the very first chapter, James chapter 1, that God cannot tempt us with what? Sin, right? He's not, he's, he can't be tempted with sin, neither tempteth he anyone with sin. So this cannot, be, this cannot be a reference to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not one that's going to cause us to lust after our flesh. So that tells me the lowercase, lowercase s spirit that's being mentioned is not the Holy Spirit. It's a reference to the spirit of our flesh, the spirit of our lust. Go with me to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. I think this will help us uh, see what lowercase s spirit this is referencing. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, and look at it with me in verse number 5. Give you a moment to turn there. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5. The Bible says this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his, what's the next word? His heart was only evil continually. The thoughts of his heart. That's that's where it starts, our heart. Our heart is the seat of everything, the wicked imaginations that's being referenced here. So this tells me the, the spirit is probably a reference to our own lustful hearts. Our own lustful hearts and the evil spirit that comes from our flesh in our own uh, wicked hearts. Now, here's, we've, uh, we've laid out for you the problems of lust and the problems of our flesh. What's the answer for getting victory over our flesh and lust? What's the answer for getting victory over the flesh and lust? We know it's a, an enemy that we're going to have to face the rest of our life. Here's the answer. I, I love the Bible because it's so practical, it lays out the problem, but then it gives you the solution to the problem. And look at verse number 6. In verse number 6, the Bible says this, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the, what? Humble. I believe here's the first, first step of getting victory over our flesh and getting victory over our lust. It's God's grace. Everything, the, the chance that we have of victory is only because of God's grace. But it starts with approaching God, seeking to obtain the grace that God's offering us in humility. 
in humility. How many of you have ever counseled someone, whether your child, grandchild, student, whoever, you've counseled someone and you couldn't move past your counseling because they wouldn't even admit that they needed help? Would you raise your hand if you've ever encountered that? It's so true. It's so true that saying you cannot help someone that first doesn't acknowledge that they need help. And I believe that's where it starts. Acknowledging that lust in our flesh is a problem that we cannot solve on our own and we need to approach the Lord for help with humility, in a spirit of humility. Asking for God, acknowledging that we have, uh, have a problem and we need help. But look what it says. In verse number, verse number 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is Mrs. Morton's life verse. Uh, it says, Submit yourselves, to, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We, the, the tendency is this, to skip over the first part of verse 7 and jump right into the resistance part. Do you know, if we're not careful, if we as Christians forget the first part of verse 7, we're going to fall into humanism. Because without submission, we skip over the submission part where we're submitting ourselves completely in complete dependence on God to bring us victory over our flesh. We skip over the submitting to God part, and then we just go right into resisting. And we fall right into the humanism trap the world, uh, world gets deceived by today. I can fix myself by myself. I don't need anybody's help. Listen, I don't care how strong your will is this evening, and there are strong wills in here, I'm sure. The strongest will is no match for your flesh and my flesh. No, don't even stand a chance. Don't even stand a chance with our, our flesh and our lust. The Apostle Paul had to die daily, the Bible says. He had to buffet his body daily, die to self, and uh, acknowledge that Apostle Paul struggled his whole life in ministry with lust and pride. And we'd be, we'd be foolish to think that we can do it on our own. No, the first part of verse number seven is key. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. It's not only approaching the Lord in a spirit of humility, saying, I need help, but also it's submitting to whatever he tells you is the solution. You're not going to like this, and my flesh doesn't like it either. It all goes back, hopefully you're still with me, it all goes back to entertainment. Because the, de the, the Lord's solution is this, if we truly seek victory over our flesh, we want victory over our flesh in our lives, we're, we should be willing to do whatever is necessary to get the victory. But the devil's got his, his hooks of entertainment so deep into our flesh today, it's hard to let go when God gives us solu the solution. Do you know what God's solution is? If your eye offend thee, pluck it out. You know what that's talking about? It's not literally talking about taking a spoon and scooping your eyeball out. It's, it's saying we should be willing to remove anything that we struggle with in our lives if we truly seek victory the way that we say we do. If someone that's struggling with spending too much time on their, their smartphones, on the tablets, computers, video games, TV, whatever... The principle is, if we want victory, we've approached the, the Lord seeking his grace in a spirit of humility, and we've submitted ourselves saying, Lord, anything you ask me to do, I'm willing to do because I want victory. And he says, all you have to do is just that TV you struggle with, don't watch it. That's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, isn't that a simple biblical principle? But you know what? People have taken the bait. Remember last week we talked about the bait? People have taken the bait of entertainment that over a TV program, over a TV program, they're unwilling to do what God reveals to them is the necessary step for victory. You're looking at me like I'm crazy tonight. I'm not. I've counseled people after people after people. I said, preacher, I don't know. My wife's getting mad at me because I don't spend enough time with her and the kids. Uh, I struggle with what I look at. I used to come off a of pornography addiction. I'm still struggling with those thoughts and putting that stuff before my eyes. What should I do? Get rid of a phone that has the capability of looking that stuff up. Well, I needed to check my Facebook and I, I checked my emails off my phone. You're not ready for victory. What you're saying to me and everyone else is you are not serious about getting victory over your flesh and your life. Because if you were, the moment that God told you what is necessary to do that, you would have jumped on it. 
this isn't popular, okay? All right? This is not popular uh, telling people to be willing to do anything God tells you to do. If we want victory, we'll do that. We'll do that. But not everybody's willing to do that. God, not everyone's willing to follow the steps and principles that God's laid out. What's the next step for victory over our flesh and our lust? Look at it in verse number 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, and then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. After we approach the Lord in a spirit of humility, trying to seek his grace, then we submit ourselves and wave the flag of surrender and saying, God, I am willing to do anything to get victory because my kids are worth it my testimony is worth it my ministry is worth it my spouse is worth it my marriage is worth it removing things that shouldn't be in my life that's a simple simple sacrifice to make for victory then we move on to resisting godly resistance godly resistance we need a purpose like daniel purposed when he, the king's meat was put before him can you imagine that? I'm just going to get off on a rabbit trail. We'll come right back, I promise. Can you imagine that? Uh, the finest cuts of meat. Anybody here carnivores tonight? I'm talking filet mignon, T-bone steak, ribeye, prime rib. Anybody awake tonight? I mean, come on now. And then all that, the king's meat's laid before you. I'm sure pulled pork was there and everything else you can imagine. The king's drink, the king's food, it's right there. Just take it, Daniel. I mean, you're away. He took you from your family. No one's going no to fault you for doing that. I mean, God, your God allowed you to be captured to begin with. Just take the king's meat. Do you know what he did? He resisted. He said he purposed, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. He purposed in his heart that he would not give in to the temptation that was set before him. The godly resistance part is, is every single day taking the gloves off and just fighting your flesh and saying, I am not going to let you win today. You know, the Bible, someone asked me this. Uh, there's a question that, uh, how do, how, how, who determines uh, if the flesh or the spirit wins out in the, faddle, the battle? Remember in verse number one, we talked about that tug of war. There's a war between the members that war in our bodies. Who wins? It's simple. You know what the answer is? Whichever one you feed the most. Whichever one you feed the most. If you get two of the same dog and you feed one like a champ and you starve the other, the one that's fed more is going to win that fight. You know what we need to do to, to, to win the battle of our flesh and our lust? Is to starve our flesh and to feast and fill up our spirit. Do you know how you starve your flesh? What we already talked about. Removing things from our life that will cause us to stumble, that does cause us to stumble, and then every single moment that we can, feast on the Word of God and feed our, feed our spirits. You know what? The reason why a lot of us lose the battle so quickly over our lust and our spirit is because your spirit is anemic. Spirits are anemic. You're expecting to beat an adversary like the devil with a very limited diet that you do every single week. You don't, you don't read the Bible much. You don't spend much time in prayer. You don't ever practice the biblical principle of fasting, those that are physically able to do that. You don't uh, spend time just uh, meditating on what you've read and applying it to your life and memorizing Scripture. How did our Savior, how did the Lord Jesus Christ, after 40 days of fasting without food in the wilderness, how did he fight off the devil? How did he fight off the devil? The word of God. He quoted scripture. In order to quote scripture, you, know, you first have to do what? Memorize it. Have it a part of your life. The more you're filled with something, the more it can't help but come out. So we've got to starve our flesh and feed our spirit. Look at verse number 8. Verse number 8. Everybody still with me tonight? All right. I know it's, I know it's middle of the week and, man, our minds are racing, but... Hopefully you're getting something tonight from God's word. Verse number 8 says this. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. These aren't, these aren't revolutionary. These are things you've already heard before. But here's the fourth thing. Getting as close to God as we can. Getting as close to God as we can. The Bible says draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God means to step closer to God. Get, uh, be closer to God today than you were the day before, than you were the day before. Draw nigh to God. Here's a wonderful principle. 
as we step to God, as we make the effort to draw nigh to God, the Bible says this, as we draw nigh to God, guess what he does? He draw nigh to us. The moment that you and I decide that where we are spiritually, this day is not where we need to be tomorrow, we try, that, uh, try every day to take another step closer to God. Take another step closer to God. Get, know the Lord more than we've ever had before. Uh, know more scripture than we did the, the week before. Memorize more scripture than we did the year before. Get as close to God as we can. Guess what he does? As we step close to him, he takes a step to us. And all we have to do is just purpose in our heart that we want it. You know, here's what, here's what puzzles me. It's available. The relationship that's close that's sweet, that's personal, that's intimate, is available to everybody here tonight. But do you know what keeps us from having that relationship? I'm afraid some good people all across this county, all across the country, good Christian people are satisfied with where they are. They're satisfied with getting their ticket punched to heaven, and they're fine with never growing past that. We have baby Christians and we have adolescent Christians, adolescent Christians, but man, what we need is some just mature Christians, some T-bone steak Christians that are sinking their teeth in meat. Guess where that starts? Having a desire to have a closer relationship than we've had the day before. Starts with a desire. Do we desire to have a closer walk with God than the day before? I pray that we do. Here's the best way. The best way to give no place to the devil. And the Bible says, uh, says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. It says, neither give place to the devil. We should not allow any part of our life to be opened up and give place to the devil. So how do we do that? What's the answer? What's the answer for not giving a place to the, de uh, to the devil in our life? Look what it says in, uh, oh, the verse we just read. In verse number 8, draw nigh to God. By drawing nigh to God and getting as close to him as possible. Number five, in verse number, verse number uh, eight, it says this. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. By getting clean. By getting clean. It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. We need to cleanse our vessels in order for the Lord to fill our vessels and to use us like he, like he wants to. Which leads to the next question. How do we do that? I mean, how do we clean our vessels and make sure it's meat for the master's use? The Bible has answers for that too. Go with me to Psalm chapter 119. Go with me to Psalm chapter 119, and we'll look at it in verse number uh, 9 together. Psalms 119 and verse number 9. The Bible tells us how we uh, cleanse our vessels so it can be meat for the master's use. Psalms 119 verse 9 says this, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy what? Word. The word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 says this, That he might sanctify, set apart, and cleanse it, with the washing of the water by the what? Word. It's simple. The, answer, the answers for the questions that we're trying to address tonight, how do we cleanse our life and how do we get close to God and make no place for the devil? How do we get the victory over our flesh? It's to cleanse ourselves with the word of God. Constantly pour the water of the word into our hearts and into our lives. But, look, but also this. Not only do we clean ourselves by the word of God, we also, uh, also cleanse ourselves by asking the Lord to forgive us of the sins that we have in our vessels. In Psalms chapter 51, verse 2, Psalms chapter 51, in verse number 2, the Bible says this. It says, wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David here, the psalmist David, is asking the Lord to wash him and the Lord to cleanse him. You know, I've learned that the Lord can clean us up more than we can clean us up. There's things that as we sit there on our knees beside our bed and we're asking God to forgive us of this sin, forgive us of that sin. Man, we're very limited, very limited in, uh, in what we can remember, at least for me. I'm 31, but 
my mind, uh, that sponge is getting drier and drier. Let me just say that. Okay, Linda keeps me sharp in the office there because I forget a lot of stuff. But I'm sitting there and I, I forget half the sins that I, I've done that day. But you know what we need to do? We need to be asking the Lord that purges us with, with, with hyssop and purges us throughly. Ask the Lord to show us things in our life that we may have forgotten that we need to confess. And he'll purge us throughly and thoroughly uh, the way we need to be cleansed. And then number six, we see this. How do we get clean? By godly sorrow. Look at it with me in verse number nine. Verse number nine, the Bible says this. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. When was the last time? Just think about this for a moment. When was the last time that your sin and my sin broke us? When was the last time that we were truly broken for sinning against a holy God that saved us? Do you understand that every time that you and I go back to the way that we used to live in the old man walking after the court, the courts of the flesh and not the spirit, we're going back to what Jesus Christ on the cross freed us from. We're literally choosing after God set us uh, in, his, in his liberty and, and gave us freedom that comes with being free from our sins and pardoned from those sins. Every time we choose to sin, we're literally choosing to be a slave again to sin. When was the last time that that broke you? Oh, Lord, oh, man, I just, I just lied. Oh, okay, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I just, I just said something I shouldn't have said. Oh, yeah, okay, well, I was gossiping, I sure was. Or when was the last time that you stopped and realized that your sin, it separates you from having the, the close relationship with Christ that he wants to have with us? When was the last time that, that like, Peter, after he denied the Lord, that he wept bitterly, the Bible says. He wept to the point that he was physically in pain after knowing that he, he sinned against the holy God. I'm telling you what, I don't know about you, but what we read in verse number 9, affliction and mourn and weep, mourning and let your joy turn to heaviness. Do you know what? Here's a, here's a way for those people that uh, may come to you and doubt their salvation. Maybe you're here tonight. And you're caught up in some things and you're thinking, boy, I tell you what, the things that I'm guilty of, there's no way that I'm a Christian. Here's a good way to know if you're saved or not. Do you feel the chastisement from the Lord when you sin and I sin? Do we feel a chastisement that comes from sinning against the Holy God? The Bible says that's a good way to know that you belong to God. Because the Bible says that like a father, our heavenly father, and like a father here would correct his son when his son gets wrong, does wrong, our heavenly father too corrects us and chastises us. Nobody here for the present time, chastisement for the present time is not joy enjoyable. But the fact that we have a father that loves us enough to correct us when we do wrong, it tells me that he's my father. Are you with me tonight? I mean, that's a good way. If, if you feel that the Holy Spirit convicts you of when you sinned, I shouldn't have thought that. Man, Lord, forgive me. When you feel that conviction and that pricking like Paul felt on the road to Damascus, when you feel the chastisement and heaviness and sorrow and brokenness, that's actually a good thing. Because that's telling me and it's telling you, the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you is still correcting you when you sin. It's actually a good thing if you feel that. But I would be petrified if I was doing those things and I felt nothing. I felt nothing. I'm not saying that you're, you're on your way to hell and you're, and you're lost if you don't feel, you know, you rip, your, you rip your shirt and fall on your knees and cry holy, holy, but... Listen, something as big as God lives inside of you, you can't help but feel wrong when you sin. I can't help but feel guilty when I mess up and sin. Could be that you've quenched the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been telling you, you need to get that right. You need to get that right. You need to get that right. And you keep pushing it off and ignoring it and not confessing it, not getting it right. Confessing and forsaking, the Bible says, and just putting it off and ignoring it. You know what happens? That voice becomes 
quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter. You say no to God enough, he will say, fine, fix it yourself. He's not going to take his gift of salvation from you, but he won't, he'll stop speaking to you like he used to. You won't experience a blessing and favor of God in your life like you, like you did when you confessed and got it right and did right. Or it could be you've either quenched the spirit long enough where it's hard for you to make out his voice speaking to you, or you are not a child of God and your, the Heavenly Father is not speaking to you because you're not his child. Just something to think about. But godly sorrow, Bible says like this, repentance by repenting. Do you know what? We as Christians should be repenting every single day. Repenting is, is turning away from the sin that causes us to fall and stumble. It's repenting. It's turning from that and turning back to Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad that we have a faithful God tonight? He's not only faithful to meet our needs, aren't you glad that we have a faithful God that will faithfully forgive us when we ask him to forgive us? I'm telling you what, if it was me, if I was God, I would get sick of forgiving me. I'm being honest with you right now. As many times as I fail, and especially uh, go to him and ask him forgiveness for the same sins constantly, I am thankful that I am not God. You should be thankful too, okay? Because I'm telling you what, I would get sick and tired of people. Are you kidding me? This is the tenth time today for the same sin? You're done. But aren't you glad that we have a faithful God that the Bible says is faithful to forgive? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 says this, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. That conviction led you to a place in your life, leads me to a place in my walk with God. That, that sorrow drives me to my knees where I can't go another moment without repenting and asking God to forgive me. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye may receive damage by us in nothing. For godly uh, sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death as a way of conclusion tonight talking about our lust in our flesh man i'm telling you what someone said this and i completely agree man's downfall can be wrapped up into three f's and if you're a lady here it's probably not going to be applicable let's just talk to the men right now especially men in ministry these have ruined men in ministry it's ruined men and their marriages Fame, trying to seek fame, trying to carve out a name for themselves and be popular. Fame, fortune, greed, filthy lucre, making uh, money their God in their life, covetousness, and then females. Fame, fortune, and females have caused a lot of, lot of damage and ruin and heartache. But I would say this, a fourth F. I want to su subject to you a fourth F, and that's applicable to everyone here tonight our flesh our flesh and the lust thereof i'm telling you what this stuff that we're encased in tonight is potent deadly stuff if we don't watch out don't think for a moment that that's that's paul's story that's peter's story that's everyone else's story but mine that that won't happen to me famous last words of every person who's ever given into their flesh you know what we need to do? We need to follow some biblical principles. How do we get the victory over our flesh? It's pretty simple when you boil it down. Approach the Lord. Ask Him for His grace in a spirit of humility. Submit to God and say, Lord, whatever you deem is necessary for me to get victory, I'm willing to do it. My marriage, my home, my testimony, my relationship with you, Everything is worth taking out some things that I struggle with. If my eye offend me, pluck it out. That's extreme. Is victory over your flesh worth it? I think so. And then we ask the Lord to cleanse us and forgive us. And we do that 
by the water of the word. If I could have every head bowed tonight, we're not going to have an invitation. I just want to actually, if you would just look up this way, I'll give you some updates on the prayer list, and we'll spend the next few moments that we have together praying. Pray for uh, the Mead family. Um, his sister, Rebecca, we've been praying for, passed away. And um, funeral arrangements, you could speak with the Meads uh, to get more details about that. Just pray for uh, the unsaved family that's there. Pray for comfort during this grieving time. Also, we pray for uh, Dr. Ray's sister, Sandra, who got in a car wreck and has quite a few broken bones and had surgery, helping her heal up and recover. Continue to pray for Ernest Nichols. And then um, pray for Terry Waltermeyer's pastor in Ohio, his sister who passed away. Pray for that family who's grieving during this time. Pray for Mrs. Reamer, who's sick. She seems like she's doing better, but just pray for her to get completely over uh, the sickness that she had. Pray for the Christians in Ukraine. See here, pray for Mrs. Longworth's grandson, Riker, who's still dealing with a viral infection. And then um, pray, pray for Leola Dillon. Leola Dillon, uh, who fell a few weeks ago and is in a great deal of pain, and she's getting an MRI soon. Just pray for her. So if we could pray, uh, we'll take the next few moments that we have. If you would uh, take your prayer, uh, prayer list that you should have gotten um, in the back there and just begin to pray through this. Let's see here. Um, brother, yes, sir. Definitely make, uh, make a mark of that on your, on your list there. And then let's take a few moments that we have. If you want to pray with someone near you, you can do that. Just pray quietly where you are. And then, let's, Brother um, Reidenauer, um, if you would, just a couple minutes before the top of the hour, just come up here and then uh, close out in prayer, please. Let's take the next few moments to pray together, please.